I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body, I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him, who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that your servant, Richard Edward, being raised with him, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. A reading from the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the servants flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Please join me in the unison reading of Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places, and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, are the Holy Ghost. You press upon me behind my heavenly hope, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I have not understood. If I climb up in heaven, you are there. If I make a grave in my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me will turn to night. Darkness is not far to view. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Lectura de la Epístola de los Romanos, capítulo 8, versículos 14 en adelante. Porque todos los que son guiados por el Espíritu de Dios, estos son hijos de Dios. Pues no habéis recibido el espíritu de esclavitud para estar otra vez en temor, sino que habéis recibido el espíritu de adopción por el cual clamamos Abba, Padre. El Espíritu mismo da testimonio a nuestro Espíritu 
de que somos hijos de Dios. Y si hijos, también herederos. Herederos de Dios y coherederos con Cristo. Si es que padecemos juntamente con Él, para que juntamente con Él seamos glorificados. Pues tengo, por cierto, que las aflicciones del tiempo presente no son comparables con la gloria venidera que en nosotros ha de manifestarse. ¿Quién es el que condenará? Cristo es el que murió, más aún, el que también resucitó el que además está a la diestra de Dios, el que también intercede por nosotros. ¿Quién nos separará del amor de Cristo? ¿Tribulación o angustia o persecución o hambre o desnudez o peligro o espada? Sin embargo, en todo esto somos más que vencedores por medio de aquel que nos amó. Pues estoy convencido de que ni la muerte, ni la vida, ni los ángeles, ni los demonios, ni lo presente, ni lo porvenir, ni los poderes, ni lo alto, ni lo profundo, ni cosa alguna en toda la creación podrá apartarnos del amor que Dios nos ha manifestado en Cristo Jesús, nuestro Señor. A reading from the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 14 and following. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who, has sent, who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live for just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Savior. Praise you, Lord. You may be seated. Most of you know that Dick didn't want a lot of attention paid to him at his funeral. Don't talk about me, he said. Focus on the gospel and the resurrection and the hope of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm sorry, Dick. I'm going to talk about you. And I'm glad you're not here to stop me. Because I have to say that the, the truth is that I'm going to talk about the gospel and the resurrection and the hope we have in Jesus Christ, even as I tell you the story of Dick Kerner. It is something of a cliche at funerals for the eulogist or the homilist to say that the deceased cared about others. I really can't think of the last time I attended or participated in a, fu in a funeral in which some version of that phrase wasn't uttered. I would like to think it's genuine. I know it's genuine today. I'm here to say that Dick Kerner cared about others. But it was so much more than those very meager words could possibly convey. Dick knew the difference between sympathy and compassion. He knew that the world doesn't change when people only ever feel bad about the suffering in the world. It doesn't change until people actually begin to see the suffering and then let those feelings feeling bad, then flow out through their lives into concrete actions. Dick knew that love is really only love when it reaches your mouth and your hands and your feet and your bank account. Dick took Jesus at his word when he taught that whatever we do for the least of these, we do actually for him. And there are all sorts of examples of this, examples that you all know far better than me because, well, you were with him for a lot of it. Whether it was wielding a hammer for Habitat for Humanity, volunteering, almost lifelong, with the Salvation Army, annual trips to Honduras to serve the people of La Ceiba and Roatan, and in the video version of this, which people are now watching a week from now, uh, we will hear that reading from Romans read by a dear friend of Dick's all the way from Honduras. Dick's heart was with, really with, the people on the margins of the world. Dick had the eyes of Christ, seeing people that most other people didn't see. But he also had holy ears, too, because he could always hear God asking him, whom shall I send? And Dick, you see, he knew the right answer to that question. Here I am, send me. But Dick wasn't only interested in helping pull people out of the river, as the old saying goes. Dick also kept one eye upriver too because he was committed throughout his life to figuring out why the people were falling in the river in the first place, or who was pushing them in. So as passionate as Dick was about meeting basic human needs, he was always equally passionate about working for the sort of just and equitable world in which there would be far less of that suffering. 
Here's what his dear friend Bill Exner, a priest in New England with whom he shared many years of partnership on the front lines of peace and justice. Here's what Bill wrote me after hearing about Dick's death a couple of weeks ago. From Boston to New Hampshire to the Gaza Strip, Golan Heights, and Jerusalem, from Mexico to Honduras to Dallas, Dick Kerner was a witness for peace and social justice. Dick wasn't as interested in peace lovers, everybody says they love peace, as he was passionate about peacemakers, peace in action. One of my dear friends, Allison Lyle, served as the executive director of the Episcopal Peace Fellowship for a number of years. When I was called rector here a little over six years ago, Allison let me know that she knew somebody from Transfiguration, Dick Kerner, whom she had gotten to know in her work with that group for many years. If you didn't know this, Dick was extremely well known in the world of peace and justice making in the wider Episcopal Church. It was work that he remained passionate about until the very end. Just last fall, I got texts and emails, many of them, from Dick wondering if he could help with our anti-racism efforts here at Transfiguration. He reminded me that he had taught classes combating racism several decades ago, back when most people still assumed that racism, you know, was almost extinct or else limited, you know, just to a few hateful bigots. But Dick knew long before the rest of the world, long before most folks realized that racism is still quite alive and well, and it will go on poisoning our society until we collectively repent and individually take a good long hard look at ourselves, at our own hearts, minds, and souls. And let's face it, Old white men have not been the most reliable group in fighting injustice, which made Dick Kerner all the more remarkable and unique. He spoke unpopular and uncomfortable truths because Dick knew that when God asked, whom shall I send, God wasn't just looking for another person to be nice and sweet. What God needed was for more citizens of the kingdom of God to have the courage of their convictions. Now the same parts of Dick Kerner that made him so relentless about peace, justice, and compassion occasionally made him <clears throat> not the easiest of parishioners. One of my predecessors, I won't name any names, commented on how Dick could be well, a bit hard-headed. I think that's the nice way of putting it. Especially if he thought that the church was spending money on the wrong things. He had strong opinions about that. Terry Roper, JD's predecessor, who would have loved to have been here, I know, told me a great story just a couple of days ago about an encounter with Dick that happened just a few years after Terry became rector. So this is late 70s, early 80s, but a good decade after the Kerners came back and became members of Transfiguration. Dick approached Terry apparently one Sunday in the handshake line and in all seriousness told Terry that the church really should start conducting its services in the parking lot in the summer because we could save a ton on our, on our electric bills and that money would be far better used in other ways. Well, Dick, I'm not sure the rest of the congregation would be so happy to worship in the parking lot in August and September as you might be. Can't you just hear Terry trying to politely respond? I had a great time for the last couple of weeks combing our files, discovering how full Dick's file was of letters that he wrote over many years to rectors and to members of the staff in which Deanie Winston faithfully filed away. It was brilliant. It was like combing through the Winston Churchill papers or something. 
because he would write whenever he thought that someone had done a particularly good or compelling job, preaching, teaching, making a leadership decision. By the time I came, of course, he was sending emails and I'm grateful to have received a few attaboys from Dick Kerner. They meant a lot. But Dick would also definitely let you know when he thought you'd made a mistake, especially if that mistake was contrary to what he believed was the calling of the gospel and the church's truest mission. Because you see, at, its, at his heart, Dick Kerner wanted to be a good Christian and not just sound like a good Christian. To again quote his friend Bill, his was often a prophetic voice. He spoke his faithful heart. He walked the walk fueled by word and sacrament. I must confess that finding people of consistent faith in the way of the compassionate Christ is no everyday experience. But when you do meet one, you remember. Dick wasn't just a warrior for the poor and vulnerable. He was also devoted to you, his family and friends. He was not perfect, of course. But I know that he loved as fully as he knew how. He loved Virginia, and they made a good if not always easy, life together for 63 years. I know that he loved his children. And though he was gone a good bit when you were little, and though I know, whew, can I imagine how he must have pushed you, he was so enormously proud of who you are and what you've accomplished. He adored his granddaughters and his grandsons, who, as his obituary so perfectly put it, were the light and joy of his life. Nadine, he adored you. He loved you so dearly. He shared with all of us how happy these last years have been for him. Thank you for loving him. I want to say on a personal level how grateful my family has been for his love and friendship. He loved my family. During the pandemic, he would text me every so often. Again, sometimes they would come in clumps. <laughs> Maybe you know something about that. <laughs> to check on how my wife and my daughters were doing. You see, he and Nadine shared a pew with Melody and the girls when we first moved here. They sat near one another, and so Dick formed a lovely fondness for my family. He was so loving and kind to them. In the handshake line, nearly every single week, he would grab my hand so firmly, and he would look me in the eye so intently, and he had a little glint, a little sparkle, and he would tell me, he would tell me how thankful he was for me. It meant the world. Perhaps above all else, Dick Kerner was a man of real, genuine, and earnest faith. The life of the church was the hinge around which Dick Kerner arranged his life. Everything turned around that, saying, the daily office, serving as a lay reader, teaching Bible studies, serving on boards, you name it. I was privileged to be his confessor for the last six years. I believe JD was his confessor before that. I can say to you in all honesty that he took his discipleship, the work of trying to be a good Christian, not just sound like a good Christian, very seriously. He's the type who, when he moves to a new city, the first thing he does is drive to the local Episcopal church and transfer his membership and sign the kids up for Sunday school. I loved hearing Liz reminisce about some of her earliest memories with her father of driving to the Episcopal church in Carlsbad so that he could say evening prayer there. 
He was a lay reader, and he helped plant Church of the Ascension, not Church of the Incarnation. He would have to be like 150 years old or more to have done that. I mean, Dick Kerner was the sort who not only signs up to take the 3 a.m. shift in the vigil, the all-night vigil before the sacrament that happens between Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. He's not only the sort who signs up for the 3 a.m. shift, he swings by to pick up his grandsons so that they can come and join him so that he has someone to pray the great litany with in the middle of the night. I know that was a special time for him. One of Dick's greatest joys was being a Eucharistic visitor. Oh, how I wish that all of our Eucharistic visitors had so clear an understanding of what they were doing and what they were carrying, because Dick got it. But he was also Dick Kerner, so he had to do it his way, of course. He wouldn't carry out the sacrament on Sundays like everybody else. He had to go on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday but it was so that he could stay and visit with the people he was taking the sacrament to and have a good long chat with them. Y'all, one of the people he took the sacrament to was a person who long ago stopped being able to come to church and he developed such an intense friendship with this man, Dave. Dick preached his funeral sermon. He was that kind of a man. I know that Dick took a great deal of pleasure in having that Eucharistic kit with him for a few extra days cruising around in his car with him. And I also know that he would occasionally take from it when he couldn't get to the church for any reason. Because for him, receiving of the sacrament was of such utmost importance. Back in the early days of the pandemic, he mentioned when we were talking about how we weren't sharing the sacrament, he He said something to the effect of, oh, don't worry, I still have some with me. And I'm like, oh, man. (laughs) Some of you may well know this story, but for those who haven't heard it, I'll share it again. It has to do with my final encounters with Dick. Back on New Year's Eve, I joined Liz in visiting Dick in the COVID unit where he had been recovering. He had been right to the brink. But as I entered the room, he greeted me like it was an ordinary Sunday at church. I thought I was going in to see a dying man, and he was like his old self. And then as I brought out communion and prepared to set it before him, he spontaneously began to recite, O saving victim, opening wide, the gates of heaven to us below. Our foes press on from every side, thine aid supply, thy strength bestow. All praise and thanks to thee ascend forevermore, blessed one in three. O grant us life that shall not end in our true native land with thee. You need to understand something. It is one thing for someone to pray the Lord's prayer with you from their hospital bed. It is an entirely different and Dick Kerner kind of a thing to have someone who you thought was nearing death, who at 91 had just been fighting off a deadly virus, recite from memory to you 12th century devotional poetry. A few weeks later, I visited Dick one more time with Andy. And this time it really was in his final few days. And he was still joyful, though not quite so lucid. And so I decided to read to him some of that same devotional poetry. And as I read the words, O saving victim, his eyes opened up, and he said the next two lines right from memory. Because they were always more than words for Dick. They were simply the language of what dwelled in his soul. Dick was not afraid of death because he knew that the one that he met throughout his life in bread and wine, the one that he served at the Salvation Army and in Palestine and in Honduras, 
the one in whom he put his whole trust and love. Dick knew that he had gone before him to make a place just for Dick. Jesus stretched his arms of love wide on the hardwood of the cross so that he could wrap his saving embrace around the whole great big world, including that lamb of his flock, that sheep of his fold, that sinner of his own redeeming, Richard Edward Kerner. So to our faithful brother Dick, life is now changed, not ended. And even though his mortal body lies in death, he is being brought home to his true and native land. So into paradise may the angels lead you. At your coming may the martyrs receive you and bring you into the dwelling place prepared for you, Dick, by your Lord and Savior. Amen. In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last day. For our brother Dick, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Dick and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raise the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal life. You promise paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother, Dick. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our brother Dick, who was reborn by water and the spirit in holy baptism. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to It is truly right to glorify you, Holy One, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. Claim you, holy God, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Holy God, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, Jesus gave himself up to death and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ who died and rose for us, you sent the Holy Spirit, your own first gift for those who believe, to complete your work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for Jesus to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Almighty God, we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and descent among the dead, proclaiming Christ's resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting Christ's coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this wine. We praise you. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you 
we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. God, our Creator, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember, O oh God, your faithful servants, Virginia and Dick, and all those who administer in your church. Remember all your people and those who seek your truth. And remember all who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and light and grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with patriarchs and prophets, apostles and martyrs, and with all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love you have fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. Grant that this sacrament may be to us a comfort in affliction and a pledge of our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all your saints through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give, Give rest, rest, O Christ to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Richard Edward. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.